Borrow Lenses is the official equipment sponsor for 105 Conversations. This is Jeff Cowell with 105 Conversations with another Espresso Shot today. And uh, I'm interested in talking to you about the future of education, technology, innovation, and leadership. And I'd like if you'd tell us who you are and why you're here. Sure. I'm Alexis Ohanian, startup guy. I'm also an investor, but I'm probably best known for co-founding Reddit.com with Steve Huffman. So if you can tell me, if you could solve education in three steps, how would you do it? Why can't I just solve education in one step? Why do I need three? Okay, well then hit me with one. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Wait, do I have a magic wand? Do I have to adhere to like reality? Yeah, no, this is the real world. Oh, okay, I will need a few steps. Um, I think, okay. Wow, solve education. And we're talking about education like full stop, not just college, not just K through 12, like education. Real deal. Okay, well I feel like the internet has to be a big part of that because it is the world's largest library. It is, you know, uh, we, 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 we considered it a, a huge loss when the library at Alexandria burned uh, and the internet is infinitely larger and more valuable than that. So having access to it is a big part of fixing education. And until we can have affordable, high quality internet access in, uh, available to every American, I don't think you can really talk about a major revolution for education. Uh, not that it's a replacement for the classroom. I'm not saying that. I'm saying it's an incredible complement to it because whether you want to watch I don't know, a Khan Academy lecture or whatever the next iteration of that is going to be about the French Revolution or whether you want to, I don't know, read some great academic paper about how paper was invented. I don't know. I mean, there, there, is, there is so much knowledge out there and having it be only a few clicks away is what makes it so empowering and so useful. And so access is probably the, that would be the foundation. That might be the step one. Step two Geez, I mean, this is so this is so complex uh, because teaching is still something that is hard to quantify. Every one of us is sort of an expert on teaching because we've all been taught at some point, and and that makes it difficult to to really come to a good conclusion about how we evaluate teaching. We all know that we had teachers in our lives that were incredible, that were awesome. We should have ways to reward them appropriately, right? I mean, if, if education is one of the most valuable components to a functioning democracy, and I believe it is, why are we not rewarding great teachers in a way that we probably should? And I, I think most people would agree with that. And similarly, how do we, uh, how do we cycle out the bad teachers? Because we've all had those experiences from the system as well. Um, and I, I don't think quanti I don't think it's a purely quantitative solution. I haven't, I mean, I haven't done a ton in this area, but there should be a way to, to better surface quality teachers. I don't think it's based solely on like, if you have a master's degree, I, there, is, there, there is far too much anecdotal and I think empirical evidence that just simply credentials isn't enough. Uh, but there's no really good system for evaluating them, but there should be. And uh, let's see, if you can have that, uh, I think figuring out an alternative to textbooks, which are a racket, uh, is a big part of that because the textbook industry is just, it's malarkey, uh, <laughs> right? They come out with a new edition just because they know people have to buy it. The cost is prohibitively high and it's a lot of margin. Trust me. Uh, when we live in an age where, you know, I can download a copy of a digital book pretty painlessly, one has to really wonder why textbooks still exist in the form that they do. Uh, especially the cost that they exist at. And even given the fact that a lot of them are pretty bad, uh, they're still part of curricula. Uh, so there's another one, textbooks. I mean, I'm, so those are probably three, those are, those are three fairly significant ones. I, I am, don't know what's best for the future of education. Those are some ideas. And what, what excites me is that there are a lot of people thinking about ed tech. There are a lot of people who are actually not just thinking about it, but also doing stuff. You know, Khan Academy is going to roll out their first set of schools, and I'm really interested to see how those fare. I mean, it's it's even if it's a brilliant success, it doesn't necessarily mean it's the solution for everyone. Uh, but it would be a really interesting data point to see if that actually works. So hopefully, it could serve as a model for others. But I don't know. I 
this is not my forte. I'm definitely more tech than I am education, but it's such a such an important thing that uh, we can't we can't really screw that one up. What about the future of tech? I mean, obviously, you've built this successful um, empire that a lot of people know about. Mm -hmm. Can you tell me? I mean, obviously, I'm an aspiring entrepreneur. A lot of the people who follow me are aspiring entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. What can you tell me about that whole journey? I mean, you've done some incredible stuff. Um, well, the details of that journey are in my book. Uh, no. <laughs> the what, what's the short version of it? The when I when I think back and, and in writing the book, as I thought back on the last, geez, nine years um, since I graduated college, eight years ish. Anyway, um, it's it's. I, I'm so grateful for all the, the fortunate things that have happened to me, and I'm aware that so much of the journey of the entrepreneur is, I, I want to say, affected by, if not determined by, uh, sort of serendipity. You know, I think there's a lot to be said for hard work, there's a lot to be said for talent. Um, but really what it will make the difference and what has made the difference for me has been simply just being in the right place at the right time and, and taking advantage of it. And, and a lot of things that were outside of my control. And I, I want to, you know, I want to be able to give a better answer than that. Cause like there's no recipe for out for successful entrepreneurship. Unfortunately, there's a, there's a kind of blueprint that I try to map out, but at the end of the day, there isn't a simple formula. Um, and, and what is kind of I mean, what may be a little disappointing for some people to hear is that a lot of it is not within your control. Um, but I hope, and I think one of the things that I've been working toward a lot in the last few years has been trying to level that playing field as much as possible because, you know, like I said, the, the, the possibility the internet creates when all links are created equal is that, you know, great ideas can spread and they can win and they can be business ideas or they can be political ideas, or they can be creative ideas, it can be any kind of idea. But we as people bring the flaws of our own society onto this network. And in order for the internet to live up to its fullest potential, in order for the future of technology to live up to its brightest, it actually needs to have that level of access for anyone to be able to use it and succeed on it. So it's, uh, it, it is, I, I hope it is a bright future for technology. Uh, but like I said, it's still we still haven't we still haven't even come close to seeing the internet live up to its full potential, and I really hope we get there. What's the biggest problem youth is going to face in the next twenty years? Oh my God! Well, there won't be youth anymore in twenty years, will they? Well, Wait. it's true, but I mean, okay. So let's say somebody born tomorrow. What are they seeing on their twentieth birthday? Um, well, if we get it right, we will see. Wow, they will have they will be living in a world with far more innovation and creativity than even we today can really imagine. And if we get it wrong, uh, it goes the other way. Um, but if we get it right, you know, we think about how much freedom promotes creativity, right? Free expression promotes, promotes this opportunity for you to just try something, for you to speak your mind about some idea, um, for you to, you know, start a campaign on Kickstarter for your daft punk jazz, New Orleans brass band tribute album, like, you know, these, these, these ideas that really, that, that these, these ideas that otherwise would have not necessarily come to fruition now can simply because, you know, the internet has made it a more efficient way to pitch that idea and get people to back it. And it could be them backing it with a retweet or them backing it with a dollar. And if we keep moving on the right direction, a 20 year old, to, you know, in 20 years, is going to have, frankly, so much better stuff. I, I really think as we get more of these ideas sort of battling it out on the, the idea landscape of the internet, it's going to lead to better things, to better businesses and better politicians and better art. And, and I think that 20 year old, I think she's going to think that, well, I, it, she'll have been building her entire life. She'll have grown up hopefully with an internet connection and she'll be programming you know before she's a teenager and she'll be creating before she's a teenager and she'll understand from the very start that like she has this platform of creativity of innovation where she can take a photo of her cat 
and put a party hat on it and put it online and people can see it and say, oh, that's a cool photo of a cat with a party hat. And she'll get this feedback from strangers that will encourage her and motivate her to be a little bit more creative. And, and she can, you know, get, she, she can be inspired by someone else's creativity and create something else. And, and I, I really hope it accelerates this exchange of ideas, which has defined human civilization, right? Like the way it got started was someone had a good idea about how to, I don't know, more effectively hunt using a stone instead of your bare hands. And someone saw it and copied it and said, that's a great idea for how to hunt. We're going to do that too. And you know what? Let's sharpen this stone a little bit more. And then, I mean, that's a, a kind of silly example, but you, you look throughout culture and innovation, you know, technology, civilization, we're all standing on the shoulders of giants. Uh, we're, we're all benefiting from those before us who have been creating and who we have learned from. And the internet embodies this very idea of collaboration and connectivity and, and does so at speeds we've never seen before, right? Like a K-pop star can have a catchy song that takes the world, takes the world by storm, that now you can play, and this is a silly example, but Gangnam Style really illustrates well how, you know, for decades I feel people, very smart people, wealthy people probably tried to make K-pop a thing in the States, like probably invested money in helping artists and, and spreading the word. And, you know, to some extent grew K-pop, but not to the point where you had a song that the pretty much the entire world now knows and like even knows a few of the dance moves to. And the reason that happened was because that idea could spread, thanks to the open internet, on YouTube and everywhere else in such a way that it could be replicated and mimicked and appreciated and, and parodied and, 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 you know, repurposed and remixed. And, you know, it's a silly concept, but it really shows how well these things can spread and, and, and what an impact it can have. Uh, and, 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 and it was something that literally five years ago could not have happened because there weren't nearly enough people connected and sharing as there are today. Tell me about legislation as we mm -hmm. move into the future. Cause I mean, you know, not getting too political on one side or the mm -hmm. other. What are we looking at? I mean, it seems like all these things you're posting on the internet, None of it's private. Maybe it's private. You, nobody knows. Yeah. One of, the, one of the things that has made the fight for internet freedom so successful thus far has been how bipartisan it is. You know, we have representatives and senators on the left and the right who, because they understand the internet and how it works, are fully backing smart internet policy, who knew that SOPA and PIPA were bad ideas, who know that CISPA, at least in a its current form doesn't take into consideration our rights to privacy as much as it should. Um, and, and I hope that moving forward as we educate our elected officials, and in some way that's our responsibility as citizens, we can get better laws that actually foster more innovation and more creativity. And we can avoid repressive laws that would stifle it. Because if we get it right, you know, we start talking about more farmers in the middle of Missouri who get their businesses revolutionized. And we start talking about more jobs being created in downtowns over this, all over this country. We talk about more artists being inspired and getting projects funded. We talk about more students being able to get a, a world-class education from their bedroom. Like These are all things that every American wants. Every American wants. And going forward, it's, it's, it's just really become clear that this is not a red issue or a blue issue. It's an American issue. And I think that's why it's been so successful. That's also why we had the bus painted both red and blue. Hmm. Interesting. Um, in your speech today, you made a phone call and I yes. thought that was super cool. Cause it was just right there and immediate. And it was kind of like, yeah, Nerve -wracking. something to pick up. You know, remember, remember when Steve Jobs called, um, Starbucks from his, no. the first iPhone. Yeah. He called Starbucks and he said, I want, a bunch of lattes. It was some big number, like 4,000 lattes and, and then hung up, but it was like, it was so real and everybody was kind of just waiting, yeah, you know, pins true. were dropping, you know? Um, so I thought it was interesting. Can you tell us, me a little bit about the, the invention behind that? Sure. Um, well, you know, I had Ben Ha who joined us for a part of the bus tour and was an just excellent champion of the open internet uh, during the SOPA PIPA fight, turned me on this app called contact Congress because something that came up in a lot of the discussions we had with people was, you know, why isn't there a way to easily, to sort of check in on how your employees are doing. By employees, I of course mean our elected officials. And and someone, I think, and Ben was like, oh, there's this app called Contact Congress, check it out. And it's such a simple app. It's a really, really simple app. And, you know, I had called my representative uh, in Brooklyn a 
couple weeks ago and I hadn't heard back yet about her stance on CISPA. I was given an email address of a woman in her office, emailed, didn't hear anything back. So I was getting ready to go on stage and I was like, geez, should I really keep the slide in here? Like, I, this could go terribly. <laughs> But, uh, but I kept it on there and I was like, all right, it, was, it seemed like a good idea last night when I was finishing my slides. And uh, <clears throat> fortunately, you know, it, it worked out pretty well on that. They were still there. Someone picked up. You know, he was, he was very polite. He did not know what CISPA was. But, and actually it's kind of my fault that I didn't know the, I actually don't know the HR, whatever number thing it is. Um, so I should have known that. But, uh, you know, he was very polite and he said he was going to get back to me and I would... Uh, follow up over email with the, the woman who I had gotten the email address of earlier. But I, I think what I wanted to show more than anything else was just how accessible it all was. It it's really, really nerve wracking I mean it's really nerve wracking on stage. Um, but it's 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 definitely nerve wracking the first time you call because it's like, oh my goodness, I'm calling up, you know, my politician, like this it at least for me, uh, and I think for, for others. But once you've done it once, it's actually not so bad because the people are generally pretty polite. You know, they'll listen to you. Uh, and, and it's that gateway that I think once you've opened, and we saw lots of people do it for the first time with Soba Pit, but once you've opened, it becomes a lot easier. And there's no reason why these politicians should not be on our speed dial, right? If you have a problem, this is the person who's supposed to be representing you in your district or your state, and they have to solve it. And now, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, I would love, we're not yet at a point where every time someone has a problem, they pick up their phone and call their representative or their senator. I'd love for that to be a problem. I don't think, I, 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 would, I would at least like us all to have this app on our smartphones and be thinking about it. Um, and if we ever get to the point where the phone lines are just always inundated, then so be it. But we've seen this at the federal level, even with something like We the People, which you know, when it first launched, I was a little, I was a little cynical because I thought, oh geez, like what? You know, this is the kind of thing that could be totally disregarded, where it's just focus all of your attention, signing up for a petition online, and we'll give you a quick little reply, and nothing will come of it. But look, we've placated these people. And I've been really impressed. Uh, and then the fact that the fact that the administration, even though they haven't always given me an answer I've wanted, have generally been pretty thorough and pretty responsive. And and when I think of the times they have given me what I've wanted, when they have responded to SOPA and PIPA and came out opposed to those bills in their form. And when they they came out most recently saying that it should be legal for any American to unlock her smartphone, like that was actually really impressive. Like, wow, it worked. Some person's random petition got enough votes, it merited a response, and the response it got was the one I wanted, and it actually is going to have an impact. Uh, and then likewise, when I see a petition for the Death Star getting a response, I'm actually really heartened because... Obviously, the United States is not going to build a Death Star. Well, maybe not obviously, but they're not. But it was a chance to highlight a bunch of programs within NASA. And so here was something that was clearly a joke that they responded to in a way that was very humanizing for the administration and actually provided value because it turned people on to all these cool NASA projects, which don't get enough attention as it is and should. So we're seeing, you know, it makes sense this would start at the federal level, but why does that not exist at every level of our government? Well, it should, and it's only a matter of time until it does. So we need to get, we're, right now our tools are limited, right? It's Contact Congress, it's the nonprofits like for the Future doing these organizational drives to push people to write or to call or do what have you. But we're going to have to get to a point where we, you know, we get a different, a, a new level of access and transparency into our government. Because like I said, I, I can tell you right now what Kim Kardashian is doing. I can see a photo of it, and as an Armenian, it pains me a little bit. But <laughs> if we have that kind of level of access, why don't we have it for our government? Yeah, that's it's rhetorical. We should. Yeah. People are working on this, but not fast enough. That's kind of a last little interest. I followed you for quite a long time. And, mm -hmm. um, when I was getting ready to really jump from my day job and do this project, mm -hmm. I was like, Alexis would totally do this. He would do it. He would go. Oh, good. You know, he would just jump and, you know, if they arrest him for whatever, you know, he would he would just, you know, do it for the people. Yeah. You know, and I think that's really cool. And, you know, I think you inspire a lot of people. And a lot of people are going to be really excited to see this. So, oh, good. Thank you for the interview. My pleasure, Jeff. Thank you.